Hello, everyone, and welcome to the last EVN Disrupt podcast of 2022. Our guest this week is Rafi Kasarjan. Rafi is the former CEO and current advisor to the CEO of UATE, the Union of Advanced Technology Enterprises. He's also the CEO of Sension and a board member here at EVN Report. Together, we reviewed the past year and spoke about the major events that took place, including the state of the tech market globally and where Armenia fits into that context, the influx of Russian, Ukrainian, and Belarusian talent to Armenia, the arrival of more global tech companies to the country, and the impact that the appreciation of the Degam has had on the sector. Thank you for listening, and I hope you all have a wonderful holiday season. Rafi Jan, thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you, Nizhde. It's great to be back. We're at the end of 2022. Uh, we're getting ready to wrap up the year. So I thought it'd be good to have you on to talk about the major events of the year and, and sort of look towards 2023 and see what we can expect. So I think we have to start by talking about the state of tech globally. It was a very different year compared to 2021 and 2020 when we saw a huge boom in startup investing and tech companies growing very, very rapidly. This year, there was a bit of a slowdown. Talk to us a little bit about the context of Armenia in the current global tech uh, scene. Sure, you're right. I would say, I mean, a bit of a slowdown is probably an understatement. Um, yeah. I mean, if we look at the major uh, indices, the Nasdaq is down by close to 30%. That's the you know the stock market that's most closely tied, that has the most sort of the largest number of tech companies uh, incorporated into the index. Uh, more importantly, venture capital, which saw a huge boom year in 2021, where the expectations that will be about there'll be about 30 to 35 percent less venture investment in 2022 than 2021. And as you know, that's kind of the primary driver of startup activity, new startup activity. Uh, in addition, um, since the markets are expecting continued slowdown generally, and companies are being more careful, especially in the B2B sector, existing invest so venture capitalists with existing investments and for example b2b SaaS or other companies are encouraging their their portfolio companies to be much more careful going heading into 2023 a little more focus on um you know expense control and you know, although growth is also important they're just saying be a little bit more careful so all of that is leading to kind of a more careful approach to market both among existing companies and new companies to be funded that's globally in some ways that has uh impacted armenia as well uh the other thing I would mention is that there are sort of these technology trends that we need to, um, that are under review, right? So in 2020 and 21, we saw COVID and post-COVID boom in anything digital uh, as people were interacting more, more online for a variety of services. That's begun to pull back in 2022 as people are kind of sort of, you know, the, the, the worst part of the pandemic's over. Um, secondly, there are these kind of mega trends, you know, uh, we saw what happened with crypto starting in November with FTX, um, and that's also in some ways impacting the blockchain market. And then, you know, uh, Facebook and others, huge investment or, or uh, let's say, belief in the growth of, uh, of the metaverse is somehow kind of hasn't proven itself out yet. So we've got the both from a technology yeah. perspective and a markets or economy perspective, we've got kind of these mm. downward forces uh, impacting uh, impacting the global technology market. Before we dive into those details, um, I'm curious to understand, the 2021 tech boom, would you accredit it largely to behavior changes, like people moving towards doing things more digitally online, or was a lot of it based on government policy around COVID and things of that nature? Well? well, I think it's both. Um, you know, I think government policy mandating isolation or, or, or separation drove a lot mm -hmm. of uh, companies to look for creative ways to be able to continue business uh, doing it online. I mean, one very uh, interesting example, for example, is uh, field service. So when you have a problem with a, a machine or or something at home, you will call the company, and that usually the first thing they do is send somebody out. Well, because they couldn't expose, you know, imagine somebody that's going to several homes or businesses to try to fix solutions. I mean, that's a huge carrier, potential carrier issue. So companies had to move more into remote field uh, service management, which incorporated, uh, the, you know, uh, using newer technologies to access devices remotely. So so I think it was sort of government policy ended up driving technological innovation. Right, right. As a necessity. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, in terms of access to, to venture capital funding, as you said, we saw a huge slowdown in, in 2022. Uh, however, there's also a lot of reports that venture capitals, venture capitalists are sitting on a lot of what is known as dry powder. So they have the funds, but they're not allocating them because they're sort of waiting back to see uh, to see what the market will look like in 2023. What do you think will be the sort of catalyst to, to see greater VC funding again? Um, well, I mean, 
obviously dry powder is good in the sense that you you have sort of you know you're not sort of um, you know fun starved to be able to to uh, drive your portfolio on the yeah. on, on the flip side it can't sit there forever right I mean there's there's a lot better ways for you know use of that money especially I mean with interest rates so high I mean it's you know uh, it could even be better for somebody to you know pull money out of a fund and put it into sort of safer investments but having said that I think you know. The venture industry is very good at spotting promising trends, right? And and so I think, for example, um, I think B2B SaaS is an area, especially verticalized um, SaaS for specific industries where things haven't been as digitized or have, and have been uh, inefficient. I think they'll continue to, to drive investment. I think AI has proven itself as a technology that's here for, to stay for the long term. It is not being applied in many more ways. And so companies that are fueling, and not just AI directly, in terms of developing the models, but infrastructure investments in things like faster databases or more energy efficient processing. All of these things are things that will continue to to attract investment. So again, I don't want to sort of paint a very dire yeah. picture. I think we've had a we, we have had a correction, but I think a correction is also healthy because you know when you're in these boom cycles, there's so much money flowing into it that the the investment criteria uh, tend to be tend to become a little bit loose, uh, and now we're uh, heading into I think tighter investment criteria, which in the long term is good. Yeah, especially in the context of AI, I think a lot of AI that we see capture headlines are really just research projects uh, that stay in academia or in large labs and industry. Uh, we've yet to see them really come to the market and turn into products that we use. Um, so I think the growth of that will will continue over the next five to ten years. And what you mentioned with um, sort of infrastructure for AI, uh, sort of the MLOP space, things like faster databases and annotation software and things of that nature, it's really exciting that we have at least four Armenian startups that are solving some really big problems uh, in that space. So Super Annotate, Active Loop, uh, Monot, and... Uh, Unum. Unum, yeah, that's right. Yeah, So that's that's really exciting that we, we have a healthy MLOPS, growing MLOPS ecosystem. And it goes beyond that. I mean, uh, there's also, so they're sort of focused on the actual sort of database processing aspect yeah. of it. Um, but there are companies like Rblox that are really focused on more on ha- having sort of uh, more more energy efficient transmission at the network layer. Mm-hmm. So that's another way that actually can, that, that's another technology that can help the development and um, spreading of AI technology. Yeah, absolutely. I should mention Aimstack in there as well and the MLOP space. One of the, the major sort of events of, of the year in terms of the Armenian tech sector was an influx of uh, Russian engineering talent to Armenia after the uh, invasion of Ukraine in, in February of this year. We saw with it uh, tens of thousands of, of Russians coming to the country, and uh, that also included the opening of several new uh, offices, I should say, um, in Armenia. Uh, some of the most prominent ones would be uh, Miro, and I believe Yandex also significantly expanded their operations here. What do you think about this for the long term? Uh, do you think the that talent is likely here to stay, or is it still something that's temporary and it's sort of in a transitionary period? Well, you know, I think it's tough to to say, Nijde, frankly, because, you know, you sort of, you know, have to put yourself in the mindset of an average, you know, Russian uh, software engineer or the, uh, the people in management that are running this, right? I mean, I think yeah. obviously in the long term, if people have forcibly moved from somewhere, they'd at some point like to come back. Yeah. At the same time, you know, I think if you just compare just the quality of life here versus Moscow or other cities in Russia, you know, even outside of the context of the political context, I mean, for a lot of people, I think they're, uh, yeah. it's been interesting. I think it's pretty, uh, Armenia has been a pretty welcoming um, a community and society to, to Russians coming here. Yeah. Now, one thing that we thought, the, uh, one problem that we thought this would help solve, which hasn't materialized yet, is that as you know, and we've talked about this before, there's this huge imbalance between the supply of qualified engineers in Armenia and the demand. The demand's always been much greater. Yeah. And we thought that this large influx of, of Ru- Russian software engineers, especially people that are working already for Western companies, either directly or as freelancers, would kind of help to, you know, to um, Mitigate that. feed into feed into the pool of available talent. That mostly hasn't happened because they're coming with sort of valuable contracts and because uh, cost of living is significantly less in in Armenia than in Russia. They're sort of you know they're they're living very well, and there's no real incentive to try to move now. Over the long term, I think that'll change because labor markets in tech are actually very very um, sort of fluid and and open and mobile. So I would expect that as Armenian companies become better in terms of attracting this talent, and and also Russians and others, Ukrainians, Belarusians becoming more comfortable living here and seeing you know being here for the longer term, I think we'll we'll see a, a, pos- a more positive impact in 2023 and beyond. As in you think. Armenia- 
Armenian companies will be able to track them to to work. Yes, and they already have to some extent. That's already yeah. happened. It hasn't happened at the level or scale that we'd like, but I think that uh, I would expect that 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 will continue. Yeah. Yeah. One one really big positive that I I took away from this is that although maybe you know there wasn't an influx of let's say senior software engineers into mm-hmm. Armenian companies from Russia, I know several startups that have been able to hire at sort of like the engineering manager or VP of engineering level, um, some really like high quality talent that they weren't necessarily able to find in Armenia before. And that might be a catalyst for growth for those specific companies. And in the Armenian context, if five or six of those companies really are able to scale and become successful thanks to those key hirings, that's a big deal for for our ecosystem, I would say. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Rafi, one of the other big events of the year was the appreciation of the dirham against the dollar. I think there was an article out yesterday that said it was the highest appreciating currency in 2022. Um, and this has had a big impact on the tech sector um, because the tech sector works primarily in dollars. Their customers are, are global and uh, the investments they attract are also in U.S. dollars. Um, speak a little bit about the, the impact this has had on companies here. Yes, uh, great question. So it ha- it's had a significant impact on both traditional outsourcing companies whose entire sort of financial model is based on the attractiveness of their rates, sort of the, the cost quality of what they deliver through their services uh, versus other, you know, much larger, you know, uh, competing uh, economies such as India or Philippines or wherever. So all of a sudden, because of the appreciation of the drum, their um, their costs have increased. You can either say that their costs have increased or their revenues have decreased by 25% because they earn in dollars and they have to spend in, in drums. Right. On the other hand, for product companies, especially venture-funded companies, but not only, again, you've got the same issue where their revenue is in is in dollars in their, and the cost can change. And, and by the way, it's not just an appreciation of the drum against uh, the dollar, but we've also had some inflation here as well. So so expenses have gone up and revenue's gone significantly down. I think that could have a serious impact in 2023. Now, the government's taken some steps to alleviate that, but they did that for, you know, sort of a temporary four-month period and see how things go. But it will mean that that the the more difficult it is for outsourcing companies to succeed, the less sort of engineers can come through that pipeline that could be potential future startup um, founders. Employees. And then for the product companies, their runways are much sort, shorter. So, you know, let's say a three hundred or five hundred thousand dollar or a million dollar investment uh, means that you've got essentially twenty twenty five percent less runway in terms of expense to until you become cash flow positive. So I think that's a trend that we need to look at very closely in 2023 and hopefully there'll be some stabilization of the stabilization of the of the currency and some reappreciation of the dollar to sort of uh, bring that back. It also comes at a particularly challenging time for the ecosystem because you you said 12 to 18 months let's say to become cash flow positive a lot of startups rely on that 12 to 18 months to just raise their next round um, and now that they have a huge challenge in raising their subsequent round especially for growth state startups that are sort of at the series b level um, where it's harder to get financing now they don't have that means to to get their next round of financing. Absolutely. We're actually yeah. seeing some startups now who would plan to go to a Series A or to the next round kind of doing bridge fin- bridge financing through yeah. um, you know, convertible notes or other or smaller rounds uh, to try to sort of wait, you know, ride the wave yeah. and hopefully until the market uh, market turns around. Right, right. The other really big news from earlier this year was that Nvidia uh, opened up their offices here. It's I would say the first really sort of big tech presence in in the country. What effect do you think this can have down the road for for having a company of Nvidia's caliber here? Well, of course, as you mentioned, I mean, I think Nvidia has been one of the stars, right? Uh, especially in the context of AI and their GPUs. Um, so it's a big name. Uh, I think that it will. We've had other big names in the past, but they've been less. I would say sort of known industry-wide. I mean, you know, we, we've talked before about electronic design automation, Synopsys, Mentor Graphics, which turns into Siemens, Virage Logic. And so NVIDIA is kind of the, in one ways, it's the exten- in some ways, it's the extension of sort of that, yeah. that tradition in Armina. But on the other hand, as you mentioned, it's a big name. Um, and it will, especially in the context of um, you know, what's happened with the Russian invasion, uh, Armenia's own, you know, sort of geopolitical stance, having, you know, a major company making an investment like that can only be seen as a positive thing. Yeah, uh, I should mention that it was noted that uh, this was in the works for a while. Uh, it wasn't a direct result necessarily of uh, of the events in Ukraine, although I imagine that probably sped up the, the process a little bit. In terms of uh, sort of the first big name coming, if we consider NVIDIA sort of the first name of that caliber to open up a presence in Armenia. Do you think it might have a domino effect for other FANG level companies like the Facebooks and Googles of the world to open up a presence here? Well, I do know that some companies um, uh, like Google in particular uh, 
uh, are taking a broader interest. AWS is also taking a broader. I'm, I'm just seeing more people from those companies sort of visiting Armenia more often. Um, I think the other thing we can't ignore is that there were a number of companies that took interest in Armenia as a result of WCIT in 2019, which was kind of the first major global right. tech event that happened in Armenia. Last year, we had Digitech Summit, which was also for the first time we had a summit in addition to the expo, mm -hmm. and the summit was really meant as an international conference that happens to take place in Armenia, as opposed to a conference about Armenian tech. And uh, we're going, we're, we're uh, unfortunately because of what happened in September, we had to delay the uh, Digitech for this year. It's going to happen uh, in March of 2023, and then uh, again in October. And we hope that, and we're really positioning the summit as a way for these, you know, representatives of larger companies to come and ex and, and see what's going on in the Armenian tech scene. And I think Nvidia is a great kind of, you know reference uh, for us to to use to try to draw more, yeah. more more folks here. When you're in interacting with people from companies of that caliber, what are the primary things they're looking for before starting a, opening up a presence in, in the country? So it's a combination of things. I mean, obviously, it's, you know, it's, it's no secret that Armenia is a small market in and of itself. So in terms of making an investment to try to sort of, you know, um, drive a lot of revenue from a small market like Armenia is really not a, not a factor to consider. On the other hand, I think, you know, tech is kind of like a lot of other industries where when somebody discovers sort of a you know hidden talent or some a uh, you know sort of on um, an opportunity that hasn't been seized before the other ones start looking into it um, obviously number one has to be the the level of talent uh, and the ability and, and creative talent so it's not just you know we certainly can't do it in terms of numbers so we have to do it in terms of quality um, and that uh, and uh, innovation and people that can think from a product perspective not just purely from a technology perspective but there are other things like you know how is government policy towards uh, uh, companies is making investments in mm -hmm. Armenia. Um, what is the continued investment in education, which has been a sore subject for, for, for many, many years. Um, but I also think, and this is actually the subject for Digitech this year, I think one of the interesting things we have, if you look at what's going on globally, right, and you've seen the geopolitical tensions and also pressures on smaller countries by larger countries, um, there's this kind of, is there a connection between sort of countries that are more democratic and have more open societies, and uh, and you know what is that relation to the growth of the tech industry? So I mean, Ukraine had a very healthy tech industry, as you know. They've had to shift a lot of it, but also continue some of it. We think about Taiwan, we think about Singapore, Ireland, Israel, right? So these are all smaller countries that are batting above their weight when it comes to tech, and a lot of it has tied to the openness of the society. And if you think about Armenian society, even before the Velvet Revolution, tech was the most independent of sectors, and we're right. seeing and, and we're continuing to see that growth. And that's going to be the it'll be interesting to see how the how the panel discussions around this uh, pan out but we've had a lot of interest from those countries yeah. to participate as a result can you tell us the dates of Digi the upcoming Digitech? yes so digitech 22 which has been postponed will take place march 10th to, th uh, to 12th of this year um again at the god and the sports complex uh and then we will uh, revert back to our regular annual cycle in On october october yes. right Shifting back to uh, venture capital for a minute, one of the things that I also thought was very noteworthy this year was um, that early stage startups, sort of at the pre-seed and seed stage level, were still able to to raise funds, um, especially from local Armenian uh, venture capital firms. We had two new VC firms that began their investments this year. One of them was Big Story VC, and the other one was Formula VC. I think combined, they've probably invested in more than 15 startups at this point, sort of at the quarter million dollar level, although the total rounds of those uh, those pre-seed and seed rounds were, were greater. I think it's really healthy that for a small and growing ecosystem, so much is relative, I would say, but uh, we have access to uh, early stage funding, and we saw several early stage startups sort of be able to get off the ground thanks to that. How do you look at the VC landscape in Armenia and I know you've been a part of it for, for many years now. Um, how do you see the growth over the last few years and what's to be expected for the future? Well, certainly. I mean, if we look at today versus even seven or eight years ago, I mean, it's completely different. Yeah. And um, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a combination of two things, Nishde. I think one is that Armenian startups or startups led by Armenian founders have attracted more sort of, you know, uh, tier one, tier two venture capital, and that's actually turned more of an eye on Armenia. So now we're seeing that when you have a local venture capital firm, some outside firms are more likely to consider it. So they're riding along on the investments, which I think is great. The second thing is that we have, 
you know, Big Story is a great example of what I call kind of like a second generation effect. Yeah. Um, so that you know, the founders of of uh, or the or the general partners of of Big Story are all start, you know uh, founders of start, uh, successful startups, and so they're now taking their learning and apply, applying it on on a broader level, and that also is a testament to the growth of the startup uh, ecosystem here. Mm-hmm. And so I expect that to continue. I think with uh, with uh, not big story the other one was formula vc yeah formula vc that's also a great combination of people that have experience in startups bringing in somebody like sap with a startup factory and sort of creating another angle to it uh, and i expect that uh, to continue as well and i think as i mentioned earlier there as retail investors become more comfortable making angel investments and then after angel invest- investments sort of you know investing in funds you'll see more i think armenian private money flowing into these uh, venture firms and that's that can only be good for the economy yeah. for the uh, ecosystem it's interesting the catalyst effects we see in startup ecosystem generally when some startup reaches or the growth stage where they're at their series b level or if they have a successful as- mm-hmm. exit there's an influx of cash and capital into that ecosystem um, a lot of those employees will go on to start their own startups because their their equity has matured or uh, or they become angel investors or VCs themselves. And as we see the sort of first wave of big start, I mean, startup exits over the next however many years, I think that's expected to grow. Do you think we'll see Armenian venture capital firms investing in later stages as well uh, down the road or... Or for the foreseeable future, will we have them at the seed and pre-seed stage as we do now? Well, I mean, I think it's dependent on a number of things. I think, first of all, it's just a matter of how much money they can attract in the funds, right? Because to to invest in later stages, you're you're talking about sort of larger tickets. Yeah. Um, so you've just got to be able to bring in more money into yeah. each transaction that you're involved in. And frankly, you know, I'm not sure that's necessary, Nishde. I mean, I think uh, VCs that are here are closer to newer startups. I think we saw that there was, you know, we kind of solved the seed investment issue here, but there's this gap between seed and a Same larger day. Series A or Series B that I think company or event funds such as Big Story and others can help to fill. But, you know, why not take advantage of the large amount of money? I mean, in, in 2000. Uh, 21, there was over $300 billion of venture, you know, sort of investment around the world to feed the later rounds because, and it has a multiplicative effect. It's not just cash, but it's also the networks that those VCs yeah. have, introductions they can make they can make to customers, introductions they can make to other portfolio companies so they can partner. So I think, I don't, I'm not sure that we really need to sort of create a whole new thing that already exists globally. And frankly, right. you want to, I mean, the fact that you can attract a Series A or Series B from a Tier 1, Tier 2 firm, not just from Silicon Valley, but around the world, means that your product and your company's value proposition is, is such that it's a it's a global value proposition as opposed to just an Armenian one. Yeah. And we've seen that the the successful startups in Armenia have had no challenges attracting uh, capital in their Series A and Series B rounds from top firms around the world. Um Okay, uh, Rafi, just turning towards our last question now, um, looking towards 2023, uh, what hopes do you have for, for the ecosystem? What should, be looking at? What, was she, what should we be looking out for? Well, I hope that the, the move towards productization and, the, and Armenian entrepreneurs, especially sort of people that have worked in larger, more established companies, their risk appetite will continue and their ability to deliver on product market fit will mean more successful early stage startups mm-hmm. uh, coming into play in 2023. I think the next big sort of, um, uh, how can I put it, um, capabilities uh, investment needs to be in not how... Uh, how well they sort of understand product market fit and certainly and not as much how they can attract investment but how they can position themselves to be able to negotiate complex deals with large partners or land large clients so i think that's the last kind of set of capabilities that you really need as a startup which yeah. is you know you've you've got the engineer you've got the idea right you've thought about you know you've done your market research you know where the white space is and you know how to sort of you you continue to iterate on your product market fit until you get there but then at some point you need to be able to you know sit across the table from a very large B2B customer or a technology partner that's much larger than you that's critical to your path to market and be able to um, sort of, you know, have a have an engaging and ultimately fruitful negotiation with them. So I think if we can solve that issue, mm-hmm. uh, I will continue to see a lot more growth. And as I mentioned earlier, hopefully some of this wave of Russian and engineers and Ukrainian and Belarusian engineers will, will will be here to stay and will also feed into the sort of the, the capacity and balance that we have. And agree with local companies, yes. yeah. Rafi Jan, thank you so much for joining us today. Great, Nishte. It's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you.